And tonight, even though we know that most churches are not Pentecostal in, in belief and practice, I want to speak to you tonight on the importance of choosing a Pentecostal church. A lot of churches out there, but why choose or what's the importance? And I believe it's important to choose a Pentecostal church. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because you have chosen a Pentecostal church. Amen. Would you look in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the importance of choosing a Pentecostal church. Let's go back to Pentecost Sunday. I'm talking about the original Pentecost Sunday. Jesus had been crucified, buried. He rose again. And then on 40 days later and sometime, the Holy Spirit came down. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. If you're there, would you say amen? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all, somebody say all, <laughs> with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And Father, tonight anoint your servant with Pentecostal power. And Father, thank you that there is a miracle in the making. And Lord, I pray that I would decrease and you would increase and that your word would go forth tonight. And Lord, confirm it with Pentecostal signs, wonders, and miracles. Lord, may tongues of fire once again set upon each of us. Uh, God, give us one, be in one accord. We're already in one place. Uh, and we'll give you the praise for it. And everybody said amen and amen. When it comes to a Pentecostal church, ask the average person at Walmart or on the street, what do you think about a Pentecostal church? And you'll get a lot of responses. And the average person on the street would say, well, they kind of do strange things at those Pentecostal churches. They run the aisles and they're holy rollers and sometimes they speak in babbling languages they're kind of strange and sometimes you'll even hear this isn't that the group in churches that handles snakes well i can tell you for sure we do not handle snakes but i will have to admit we are kind of strange sometimes you know i it, it, you know this um, natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And if you're not full of the Spirit and not been birthed in Pentecost and you see the manifestations, you might think it's kind of strange. But despite what people say about us and despite the preconceived ideas and maybe even some have had bad experiences uh, in the past, there is something about the Pentecostal church. And one of the most important decisions of your life is who will you marry? What college will you attend? Where will you live? Where will you buy a house? Where will you, um, what job will you take? But I'll tell you, along with those great questions of life, uh, one of the greatest questions that we've got to ask uh, and we need to have an answer for is where will I go to church uh, on any given Sunday? Where you choose to go to church will affect you. It'll affect your children. It'll affect your grandchildren. It'll affect your ministry. It'll affect your impact in the world. One of the most important decisions is where you go to church. And I want to tell you why tonight of all the churches. And please understand, I love any church that preaches Jesus and Him crucified, buried and rose again, heaven real and hell hot. Whether it's Baptist or, or whether it's Reformed or Methodist, Catholic or Presbyterian, Praise God, they're all precious to God and they're brothers and sisters in the Lord. But there is something about a Pentecostal church, uh, and I believe it's important uh, that you attend a Pentecostal church. Now, we're not the only ones, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I'm not saying that the Pentecostal church doesn't have its problems, uh, and I'm not saying it's wrong to be members of those churches. Uh, and by the way, Pentecost is not a denomination. Pentecost is an experience.
sense. Uh, Pentecost is not some headquarters in another state. Uh, Pentecost uh, is from heaven on high. Praise God, Pentecost uh, is much larger than the church uh, itself uh, as far as the building. Uh, Pentecost is from heaven, uh, and I believe it's important that you choose a church. Uh, I don't care what the name on the door is, uh, but they need to be somewhere in there, a Pentecostal manifestation. Uh, it's important. Somebody put your hand together and praise the Lord tonight. It's important. It is important to choose the right church. Number one, it's important because it most resembles the early church. In our text tonight, we find the birth of the church. And from day one, it was a Pentecostal church. And we know the word when the Acts 2 and 4, 1 through 4 again. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Pentecost was a Jewish feast. It was the, uh, the harvest, uh, the early harvest. You know, you had the feast of Passover. And then uh, six weeks later, you have the first fruits is what I'm trying to say. And uh, the first fruits were the first crops began to pop up from the ground. Uh, and uh, those that were ripe, you would reap them and give them to the Lord in anticipation of a greater harvest later in the year. And brother and sister, that's if we're going to reap the harvest, praise God. If we're going to be like that early church, do you think they reaped the harvest? Oh, they sure did. And if we're if we're going to be what we need to be, then we need to have what they had. Amen. The Bible says three thousand were saved on that day of Pentecost, and later five thousand were added. Churches built. Miracles took place. Rome was, was challenged and eventually defeated. Why? Because the early church was a Pentecostal church. Amen. You've got to understand that in Acts chapter 2, Go back to Acts chapter 2. Who was there in the upper room? Saved people were there in the upper room. Amen? Saved people, sanctified people, people who loved the Lord, people who obeyed Him. They had all the qualifications. It says here in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, and being assembled together, He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith He, You have heard of me. For John truly baptized in water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not any days hence. This is Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. And then jump down to verse 8. But you shall receive power after that, Acts 1 and 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and into the uttermost part of the earth. And that's exactly what they did. And if they needed, these were saved men, sanctified men, obeying the Lord men. But they were incomplete until the Holy Ghost came rushing in like a mighty rushing wind. And if they needed it, how can we say we don't? It's important to choose the Pentecostal church because it most resembles the early church. And if you think, well, that was just Acts 2, and there was a large international delegation worshiping and so tongues came to speak into their languages there and it goes on to say that there were Corinthians and Corinthians and this one and that one and they heard each in their own tongue speaking the wonderful works of God however 30 years later just to put that in context 1993 was 30 years ago were you here amen <laughs> hallelujah don't seem like it was that long ago, does it? Oh, that was my pre-marriage days. That was my pre-ordained to ministry days in 1993. I was a student at East Carolina University. Let me tell you, 30 years later is 2023. Go to Acts chapter 2 is 1993. Acts 19 is 2023. 30 years later in Acts 19, look what happened here. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain what? Disciples. And he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said, We've not so much as heard where there be any Holy Ghost. And I'm just going to 
right there for time's sake. This was 30 years after Pentecost. You got to imagine it being 1993 to 2023. Let me tell you, 30 years later, they still needed the Pentecostal experience. 60 years later, they still needed the Pentecostal experience. 600 years later, they still, 2,000 years later, in Azusa Street and on in the Pentecostal Holiness Church and the Church of God in the hills of Cleveland, Tennessee. I just been in their camp meeting, so I'm going to let preach a little bit. Hallelujah. I want you to understand something. Uh, the, it resembles uh, the early church. Uh, he's still pouring out his spirit, uh, and it's important uh, that we choose uh, a Pentecostal church. Notice I said the word choose. Unfortunately, we have too many choices nowadays, and that can be good, and sometimes it can't be good or isn't so good. If you've got health issues and you go to a buffet and there's 16 different desserts, that might be a lot of choices, but it might not be that good for you. Amen. <laughs> and we've got all kinds of churches, all kinds of doctrines, all kinds of beliefs. Why don't we get back to the book? Why don't we get back to the upper room and let's choose a Pentecostal church? Put your hand together and praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> It really wasn't until the early church fathers died out. It wasn't long until the church became cold and formalistic, dead, lukewarm. False doctrine was rife. And the, and the post-apostolic church ceased to be in a Pentecostal church. A story is told about how a church father, Thomas Aquinas, who met Pope Innocent IV, and they had a large sum of money at the table. And the Pope explained, exclaimed, You see, Thomas, the church cannot now say, as the primitive church could, silver and gold have I none. Look at all this wealth we have as a church. Look at all of the cathedrals. Look at all of the grandeur. And you know what Thomas Aquinas said to him? Yeah, we can't, we can't, we can't say silver and gold have we none, but neither can we say rise, take up your bed, and walk. Oh, God, give us another Pentecostal outpouring. Amen. Number two, why choose a Pentecostal church? And pastor preached on it tonight because of Pentecostal power. Amen. <laughs> when you have true Pentecost, you have power that's not of this world. You have power that's real. You have power that can set the captive free. I heard uh, one of the speakers at the Church of God camp meeting, he's 61 years of age, he went to a church, a small church in Georgia, and he built it from nothing to over a 1,000 people, Church of God. And he said, Brother, we had Sunday night church. He said, I know some churches don't have Sunday night church. He said, you do what you want to do. He said, but when are, when are you going to get your people filled with the Holy Ghost? He said, well, our church has, he says, a lot of pastors say, we have small groups on Sunday night. And he said, small groups are not bad. I'm not against small groups. He said, but I don't see the Holy Ghost falling on a small group. He can. <laughs> he said, we, we need to have Pentecost. Amen. <laughs> there needs to be power in our church services. Hallelujah. And I'm like, praise God. Here's a man that grew a church uh, with Pentecost. Amen. Uh, it can be done. Praise God. Uh, we need to quit compromising it. We need to quit being ashamed of it. Uh, we need to quit, quit trying to let people who are liberal and think that they can do it without the Holy Ghost and uh, not without the Spirit. And people like me and Pastor Jerry, we just kind of laughed at. But that's all right. I'd still rather choose a Pentecostal church uh, because there is something different. Different. There is power. There's miracle working power. Souls are saved. Lives are changed. Can somebody say amen? And people are bound, and people are bound today like never before. You know, in the 50s, in the 60s, there was most people were hardworking people and didn't really have a lot of it. It was churched, a Christian America. But the sexual revolution hit in the 60s. Free love and divorce became absolutely easy where it was very hard to get a divorce. 
And it became divorce on demand. And then one thing after another, abortion was legalized. And then uh, free sexual expression. And then the rising gay movement. And, and we have the woke movement. And we have people today, seven years of age, talking about, I want to change my gender. We have people today hooked on internet pornography and child molestation. And people who, they've come to the campus of this church and they don't know our songs. They don't know our, our uh, John 3, 16. Uh, and I'll tell you what's going to help them. It's not going to be a program. It's going to be power from on high. They're going to they're have to feel something not of this world. Uh, I would choose a Pentecostal church for my family that's hooked on drugs, uh, that's hooked on pornography, that's hooked on uh, all of the things of this world. Uh, there's power in a Pentecostal church. Say amen. A cold, formalistic church is not going to help in a world that is bound by chains, addictions, depression. After the war, talking about World War II, there were some pictures that were in a magazine, and it showed three pictures. One picture showed a large tank, and it was bearing down on this one little soldier. And just as the tank was about to overwhelm him, the picture in the next frame showed that that soldier had gotten what was called a bazooka, which was this huge state-of-the-art gun, and it was a rocket launcher. And so the first picture was this huge tank and this little soldier. The second picture was the soldier getting a bazooka, this new weapon. The third picture was this big soldier with this high-class technology weapon, powerful weapon, and a little bitty tank. <laughs> oh, I heard that illustration from a Baptist preacher. Thank you, Sister Becky. Hallelujah. And I just want to tell you something, that when we get the Holy Spirit and when we get Pentecost, brother, there is power, and that little uh, problem and that little issue will become just like that uh, because it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Uh, and that's why it's important to choose a, a Pentecostal church. Can you say amen? Number three, we should choose a Pentecostal church because it resembles the early church, because of Pentecostal power. And number three, because we have a greater relationship with God the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. You see, Pentecostalism is more, people say, well, you're just emotional. And yes, we are emotion, emotional, but Pentecost is more than emotions. Pentecost is more than a denomination. Pentecost is really about a person, and that person is God, the Holy Spirit. You see, God is Trinity, uh, Father, Son, and Spirit. You see, we are one person with body, soul, and spirit, with three of, uh, of nature, a trifold nature, and one person. But God is three persons with one nature. And that's hard for us to understand. But God, the Holy Spirit, is real. He's not just a mist. He's not just a force. He's not just a, a, a thrill up your leg. People say, talk, talk about the Holy Spirit like, well, he's just a feel good and he just is a picker upper. And, and we're kind of diminishing the awesome person of the Godhead. By the way, he is a force. And if you get in touch with him, you will feel a thrill up your leg. I'm not diminishing that either. But we got to, and, and we sang that song over Easter. And, 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 I, and Pastor Jerry and I, we've just been so busy. He's going this way, I'm going that way. And uh, I was going to get together with you because I don't, I was, I was saying, you know, we sung that song, send it on down, send it on down. Lord, let your Holy Ghost, we, you know, it's a great song, amen? And Brother Mike Bynum did a great job, didn't he? And Brother Bill, amen? But I started to sing, started to change that, to send him on down. Because the Holy Spirit is not a it, Amen? <laughs> But if you go to the rest of the song, it says, power, Lord, power, Lord. So it can refer to the power, but it all refers to the Holy Ghost. And he's a person. Amen? Amen? How do we know that the Holy Spirit is a person? Look at John chapter 14, verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For what? He dwelleth with you. 
John 15 and 26, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 16 and 13, howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He, verse 14, shall glorify me. The Holy Spirit by our Lord is referred to not as an it or a thing or a force alone. He is referred to as a person. Co-equal with the Father, co-equal with the Son. It's not God Senior, God Junior, and God Holy Spirit. It's one God, all three and three and one and one and three, equal power, equal glory, equal worship. Uh, each has a different uh, function. They they operate in different areas, and and but that doesn't make one less than the other. We're talking about the mighty triune God. Isaiah said he heard the seraphim say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Uh, all Almighty. Somebody put your hand together and praise the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. That word grieve is a human word. It didn't say, you know, you, you can, I can break this pulpit, but I can't grieve it because <laughs> it's not a living thing. I can damage it and if the Holy Spirit weren't in a living presence, and people do grieve the Spirit, and it lets me know that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. And one of the prayers we should always pray is, Lord, help us not to grieve your Holy Spirit. Help us to bring joy and expression to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 5, go back to Acts, it says, Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to who? The Holy Ghost. And to keep back part of the price of land, go, back, go to verse 4. He then goes on to say, Acts 5 and verse 4, While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So in verse 3, he says, you've lied to the Holy Ghost. In verse 4, he says, you've lied to God. The divine attributes are true in the Holy Spirit. He is omnipresent. There's nowhere the psalmist said, I can go from his spirit. He has all power, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And he is, has omnipresence, omni, oh, excuse me, omniscience. Who hath known the mind of the Lord, but the spirit of God. Oh, he is amazing. And years ago, and Benny Hinn wrote a book called Good Morning, Holy Spirit. Oh, let me tell you why you should choose a Pentecostal church. Because, you, you, yes, we love the Father, we love the Son, and we love the Holy Spirit. He's not just a mystery. He is my helper. He is my comforter. He is my advocate. But you know what? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, but we also have an advocate called the Holy Spirit. He is our advocate that, that, uh, that uh, pleads the case of God to us, and Jesus pleads us to God. Praise God. I'm covered by a dream team. Amen. Uh, oh, choose the Pentecostal church. It's important that you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Uh, would you just praise him tonight uh, and bless his name? name tonight I had a, when I was at Southern Nash Junior in my eighth grade year I had a band teacher that I we just all of us loved him he was just the favorite teacher we had a wonderful band class and he uh, he and I was on fire for God. I'd go to these revivals with Steve Edmondson, and we'd come in on Monday mornings. And we had <laughs> Steve Edmondson. I would ride in the back seat of his car, and we'd go to Bethany, Williamson. We'd go to Wilson. We went up South Henderson th four years in a row to the old church. I mean, we went revival every Sunday. And, and that man was anointed, and when people would run the aisles and get saved, and I'd come in on Monday, and, and Mr. I ain't going to call his name, but my band teacher, <laughs> he, was, he went to a non-Pentecostal church, Sister Becky, that you probably know some of the people over there, so I'm not going to call the name. <laughs> but, uh, but we got it. I said, I said, sir, you need the Holy Ghost. He said, 
I got the Holy Ghost when I got saved. And he smoked cigarettes. And he also, he, he, now, now today it's more acceptable. Back then it was a sin. I'm telling you, back in the, the Pentecostal church when I was coming up, buddy, you didn't, even, you didn't even get secondhand smoke without getting under conviction. Come on now. I mean, you didn't even walk around it. And if you drove by a tobacco farm, you better hope it wasn't your aunt and uncle that, that sold it and raised it. You'd be in trouble in a lot of ways. But, but he, and he would every now and then, he'd slip up and say a full letter curse word. Nothing major, but he would just kind of get ill with us students and say a little cuss word. But I would tell him, Mr. man, we were in revival. You should have been there. Uh, and he would just he would just scoff at it. But I'll never forget. One day, on a Monday morning, I came in to bring my instrument. First thing I had to do is drop my drop my instrument off. And he said, Brother Nelms, guess what happened? Before I could turn around, he said, I got the Holy Ghost. He started dancing, speaking in tongues. And then when I realized what it was so fast, when I realized what students coming in and coming out, I took off dancing and went the other way. Praise God. My band teacher got the Holy Ghost. Friend, it makes a difference. Did he stay in that church? Was it a good church? It was. Good people? Yes. But I'll tell you where he found himself. He started going to Middlesex Church of God and eventually to Farmington Heights. And I believe he still attends there to this day. Praise God. You know who my band teacher was? All right. Well, you, did, you didn't know that I was the one that, that, that kept egging him on to get the Holy Ghost, did you? You didn't know that. See, praise God. Hallelujah. He chose a Pentecostal church because he wanted his wife and his children to be raised and Pentecost. Why choose a Pentecostal church? Why is it important? Number one, it most resembles the early church. We need to get back to Acts. I was at this Church of God camp meeting this week, and I'm telling you, I'm just going to give some honest confession. Some things have happened in the last few weeks and months that have, I told one preacher in Virginia, said, I don't know if, if my church, talking about my denomination, they're moving in a direction, not just in our conference, but in other conferences. They're moving in a direction that's, I'm going to just politely say, it's not classical Pentecostal. And I love these brethren. And I'd go to conference, and I see this one getting recognition and this one being looked at, and I'm like, there's no Pentecost. I'm okay, Pastor. You, you. <laughs> and so I said, I'm going to Church of God camp meeting, you know, because I just want to be in the atmosphere. Praise God. I know it's here at Westmoreland. I know, it, I know it's here at Westmoreland, but, you know, I'm also having to work, and I can't really get into it like I want to a lot of times because I'm on the piano or whatever. But, uh, but my feet are moving. You might not can see it. But, brother, he preached. Yesterday morning, on Pen he said, we need to get back to the Holy Ghost. He gave three things that happened in Acts chapter 2. He said, the wind came. He said, the fire came. And he said, tongues came. And he talked about the meaning of the wind. He talked about the meaning of the fire. He talked about the meaning of the tongues. I had never heard that preached in all my years of Pentecost. And I'm telling we came to the altar. He said, I want all the music to stop. He said, if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and he gives you utterance, start speaking in tongues. And no music, but all across that sanctuary, you heard, he said, this is the sound of Pentecost. And people were being filled. And the speaking in tongues was going up. It was powerful and wonderful. And then this morning... Their youth director for the state, he's about my age, sharp-looking guy, unlike me, <laughs> nice-looking, and he said, we're having youth camp. He said, I want you to know, I want these teenagers full of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. He said, I know there's other things for them. I know that they need to be this, that, and say. He said, but I want them to have. I said, oh, my God, this is the state youth director pleading for a Pentecost to come. Brother, that's me. Amen. That's where the wind is blowing. That's where the spirit is moving. That's what we got to get back to, be at Church of God, Pentecost, the wholeness. I don't care. I think it's important to, to be filled with the spirit of God. 
Would you put your hand together and praise him? Number four, it's important because of the impact of lively church services. You know why it's important to choose the Pentecostal church? Number four, I'm not sure if we got it up there or not. Number four is because it's important because of the impact of lively church services. Let me tell you something. A lot of churches start 11 o'clock sharp and they end 12 o'clock dull. Now, I'm not telling you, and this is what people criticize us for, well, it's not all about the shell. It's not all about emotionalism. It's not all about that. And I agree with that. Just be, God can move in a holy hush. And you can, I do believe you can worship God with a tear running down your cheek. Not everybody's going to shout and dance like Jerry R. Nelson. Amen? He wants you to. <laughs> I try it. <laughs> Pastor, my legs aren't as long as yours. <laughs> and I got a little extra weight. <laughs> and you got height. <laughs> and a short person with weight doing this better be in the Holy Ghost. Amen? <laughs> or it's going to be a crater on the floor. <laughs> I'm just telling you. But I love God. I want to worship Him. And I'll tell you, a dead church service, ritualistic, humming out prayers, sing three points in a poem, and a little history lesson and a lecture is not going to meet the needs of a hurting and a dying world. All of the problems, I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart, all of the contemporary problems we Pentecostals should have been and are and can be the shining light in this dark world. COVID-19 hit. Our Pentecostal churches should have had healings like they did in the 50s. Not judging people and not getting political and use this side and that side and the CDC and Fauci, Grouchy, whoever, and get a jab and a, and a, and a nab and whatever you want to get. <laughs> Get the Holy Ghost, amen? I'm not against medical uh, procedures, not at all. But I will tell you this, uh, and you're talking about woke and racism. Did you know what fire does? Uh, fire will, t you can take, you could take uh, that, that, uh, that bush over there that's green and you could take that chair that's gray and you could take my coat that's black and you can take his shirt that's green but you put all of that in the fire that green is gone that black is gone we are one blood one people folks now is the time more than ever for Pentecostal churches to not water it down to say we are going back to Acts it's important to have lively church services. Say amen. <clears throat> so praise God. Get full of the Spirit. Now the Lord is that, 2 Corinthians 3 and 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. People say, you don't need all that hand clapping. You don't need all that shouting. Well, I'll be honest with you. The Bible says, if I hold my peace, the rocks will cry out. I remember, and I'm coming to a close. I sense Pastor Jerry is ready to take over. Amen. Amen. And that's perfectly fine. But I remember the first time I went to Spring Hope Pentecostal Holiness Church. Elmer Moore was the pastor. That's one of those revivals, Steve Emerson. Steve, my granny. Steve, my Steve, when about 20 years old, 25, little skinny, young, fiery evangelist. And we pulled up, and we got out of the car, walked up. We opened the door, and we heard a man praying. Immediately, I'm a teenager. Immediately, it struck my soul. I fell under conviction. I felt it was so beautiful. And that man had a glow about his face. And that church, I'm telling you, Brother Woody, it was glory. The Shekinah glory was in that place. We got to singing and praising God and running around. And Steve would preach and those people would shout and, and souls would get saved. Lives would be changed. And Brother 
Elmer, I saw him one time roll. A holy roller, amen. And he he most most of all, he would get on his knees and under the power and he'd begin to shout on his knees. I'm telling you, he was one of the most Pentecostal godly men I ever knew. And that church, as long as he was the pastor there, I'm telling you, we would go say, when we're going to Spring Hope. When we're going to Spring Hope. Oh, my friend, that's the way it ought to be in every church. Amen. Let me close with this story. I, I believe it'll tie it all together. And then we're going to worship. Praise God. So, is it important to be a part of a Pentecostal church? Now, if God calls you to another church, you be Pentecostal in that church. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Turner Gleason. Anybody ever heard of him? He was a famous musician that played on Broadway. And he began to travel in shows across the nation, became very wealthy. But his wife ran into some Pentecostals. His dignified family was forever changed. And they had an old tent meeting. And his wife got full of the Holy Ghost, and she begged her husband to come. I'm not going. He looked down on them. He tried to keep her from going. But sure enough, he came in a starchy suit, looked down. He's a wealthy musician, traveler, Broadway musicals. And he humbled himself to get under that tent. And, it, and all during the service, he kept joking to his wife, the preacher all he wants is money. See those people that are acting crazy. That's fake. But something, Brother Philip, happened. His wife went to the altar, and the spirit broke out. And when she came back, she went to go get him to leave. And he said, hold it just a minute. She said, what do you want? She said, he said these words, I want what these people have got. He got down, got saved sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, tongue-talking that service. He said, I want to get water baptized. And they went out and baptized him in water. And God got a hold of his heart. Amen. He had eight children to raise during the Depression. And one day they received a letter in the mail, registered mail. It said, you've inherited $4.3 million. Now, $4.3 million in 1932 would be like $40 million today. Now, how many of you would like to get a certified letter saying you have $40 million? But here's the catch. Here's the catch. You've got to move to England and live on an estate to inherit that money. So he did some checking out. He went over to England. And you know what he did? He denied it. He said, I don't want it. Well, why don't you want it? He said, I couldn't find a Pentecostal church to take my family. He said, I can't afford $4.3 million because I've got to raise my family in the truth. And he never would talk about it. Before, before he died, they asked him, Daddy, why did you do that? He said, it's just one of the many decisions a man has to make to keep his children in church. Now, here's the rest of the story. You can stand. In 1998, the family had a reunion, and he had been dead for many years. Of his 100 descendants, out of the eight children, all got saved and all got filled with the Holy Spirit. Four of those eight of his children were in full-time ministry. Six of the grandchildren were in full-time ministry. Only one grandchild was backslid, and he prayed for him until his dying day. And they said that his la that last grandchild at 75 finally got saved. And in 1998, uh, he was 75, and they said, quote, he runs the aisles of the church every Sunday. His family started churches, Bible schools. They were strong leaders and deacons in churches. Uh, my friend, uh, there's something important about choosing a Pentecostal church. Don't you get sidetracked by the things of this world. Don't you get so bogged down that you can, well, I don't have time. Don't you ever, ever think that it's not important that we come and let God show up and God show off. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place, Pastor. And Father, we thank you tonight. We praise you tonight. Signs, wonders, and miracles, let it be done in a Pentecostal church. Oh, God, make us Pentecostal people, Lord. Hallelujah, Father. Holy Spirit, 
Thou art welcoming this place right here. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcoming this place. Omnipotent of mercy and grace. Come on. Well, Is he welcome? Come in this Come in on this down place. as a form of worship to the altar. Just lift your hands up as a prayer to the third person of the adorable Godhead, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Say, I welcome you into this sanctuary and into my temple. So you are the temple. So welcome the Holy Spirit into your temple. Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, thou art welcome in this You're welcome place. in this place, Lord. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome. See, that healing that some of you need, the Holy Spirit, is the one that manifests that. He's the one that takes the work of the cross and applies it to your heart and into your body, into your mind, your spirit. And miracles and signs and wonders happen. Spirit, oh, thou art well. Oh, he's welcome. Yes, Holy Spirit. 